Part 2 16. Controlling Rhythm All things have their own rhythm. Releasing an arrow, firing a gun, and even riding a horse have distinctive cadences. Rhythm must never be contravened in any of the arts. It's easy to see rhythm existing in arts like music and dance, but Masashi speaks of it existing in all things, from combat to commerce. Rhythm is also present in things that are invisible. For the samurai there is rhythm in how he succeeds in service or falls from grace. There is rhythm for harmony and rhythm for discord. In the way of commerce there is cadence in the accumulation of great wealth and a rhythm for losing it. Each way has its own rhythm. Judge carefully the rhythms signifying prosperity and those that spell regression. Understanding this is quite a conceptual leap. One approach is to consider how it might apply to something you are already familiar with. There is rhythm in conversations. How they begin, how they flow, and how they end. There are conventions surrounding them, and a beat to the general energy and cadence of how they pan out. Someone stacking all their points in charisma can intuitively identify such underlying rhythms and manipulate them, directing conversations where they want. Even your autistic self might at times be able to do so. Knowing this, you could choose to disrupt a conversation's flow, to muddle and wrong-foot the other party, perhaps before making an important request. He may start to collapse when his rhythm becomes muddled. In fact, the verb to doorstep even means to wait at someone's door or desk so as to ambush them with a question or request. The thought being the other party is on the back foot in such an encounter and already out of rhythm. Catch him off guard by changing rhythm. Do not engage if you sense that he knows what you are going to do. So, considered in this way, we already have some understanding of the rhythm Masashi refers to. You have only to extend the thought to see how the following might also be true. There are myriad rhythms in strategy. First, the warrior must know the cadence of harmony and then learn that of discord. He must know the striking, interval and counter cadences that manifest among big and small, fast and slow rhythms. In combat it is critical for success to know how to adopt the counter rhythm. You must calculate the cadences of various enemies and employ a rhythm that is unexpected to them. Use your wisdom to detect and strike concealed cadences to seize victory. It's important to note that disrupting an opponent's rhythm requires more than just doing the unexpected. If you recall, Masashi referred to fast as being out of sync with the rhythm, so it's perfectly possible to become out of sync yourself by performing techniques with incorrect intervals. Instead, what is required is the adoption of a technique with a counter rhythm. You could perhaps analogize this to changing step mid dance. You still need to stay in time with the music, but your step change can throw off a partner who's not expecting it. Masashi only speaks directly of rhythm at the end of the Earth book, but look for it and you'll see it underlying many of the techniques he describes. For example, the two phase traversing cadence. If the enemy parries or retreats as you are about to attack, feint a strike and then follow up with a second real cut just as he relaxes after backing off or parrying the first attack. The cleanup initiative. Repel him with a superior intensity when he moves in to attack. He will then change the cadence of his assault. Capture the instant his rhythm changes and secure victory. Or the flowing water strike. When the enemy you face quickly tries to back away, disengages his sword or tries to press yours, at this point inflate your form and spirit, move forward first with your body, then with your sword, and cut him with conviction as if you were enveloping him in torpid water. Broadly, these describe changes to the rhythm of movement at moments when the enemy is not expecting them, resulting in confusion and opportunity. One may cynically contest that this is just an over-laborious way of saying, be sure to counter your enemy's moves. Perhaps that's the case, or perhaps Masashi was pointing to a deeper truth. As always, he says, cadence cannot be mastered without substantial practice. 
Either way, it's pertinent to ask how such a concept can be adapted to modern life. If there are truly rhythms to everything, then you can think of them as extending from customer service situations to job interviews, business pitches, work projects, client emails, and even PTA meetings. In each case, social norms dictate preconditioned paths, with one action following the next in a recognised rhythm. Such rhythms make society safe and predictable, but can also be disrupted to create opportunity. When doing so, techniques such as silence, humour, vulnerability, directness, or even extreme generosity can all be used to break the matrix of normal rhythms to bring about novel results. The extent to which each is advisable or even moral depends on the situation though, and ideally your counter-rhythm still needs to be socially acceptable or you'll fall out of rhythm yourself. Master the conventional rhythms of combat and determine how the enemy uses his sword. You may also wish to turn the disruptive force on yourself and consider what rhythms you have settled into that can be disrupted with a counter-rhythm. This can apply to bad habits, but also mindsets and moods. In this case, the opponent becomes the comfortable or complacent side of your psyche. It is important to take the initiative and take advantage of the enemy's state by distinguishing fluctuations and pinpointing the intervals in his rhythm. On the topic of disrupting an opponent, Masashi mentions, All things can be infectious. Drowsiness is infectious, as is yawning, even time is communicable. This means that you can deliberately transpose negative emotions onto an enemy, then capitalise on them. You can contaminate his mind by exhibiting listlessness, hesitancy or weakness. And, as with all good strategy, it applies to all scales. In large-scale strategy, if you sense that the enemy is agitated and hesitant, pretend not to notice, and take your time. Seeing this reaction, the enemy will drop their guard. With your mind set free, attack mercilessly the instant the enemy has been infected by your inaction. Optionally, you can evoke specific emotions through different styles of aggressive behaviour. Irritation is evoked by assaulting aggressively when least expected, or by moving slowly and then suddenly. Agitation from threatening danger, presenting an impossible task, or by causing a sudden surprise. And fear is caused by doing the unexpected, for example attacking the flank or shouting loudly. In the case of individual combat, it is important to beat your opponent by doing something unexpected with your body, sword or voice to startle him. A cry is a vocalisation of one's life force. But, as mentioned earlier, avoid shouting during a genuine strike. It is mostly reserved for intimidation. Do not cry out loudly as you strike with your sword. If you emit a cry during the attack, it should be low in tone and match your cadence. The most interesting of all emotions, however, is confusion. One may initially assume confusion leads to anger, and then perhaps to carelessness. However, the result is actually demoralisation, apathy and listlessness. This makes sense if you consider that, as a species, we are predisposed to look for meaning. We see shapes in clouds, patterns in numbers and messages in tea leaves, and then we use this meaning as motivation to act. When confused, we cannot make sense of the world, meaning is lost, and therefore so is all motivation to act. To cause confusion is to make the enemy lose heart. This concept amounts to an inversion of Nietzsche's famous line, if we possess our why of life, we can put up with almost any how. Utterly removing the why means we cannot put up with any how. Confusion as a line of attack can be employed against individuals, groups, or even entire societies. Calculate what is going through the enemy's mind. Cause confusion among the opposing troops by making them question, here or there, this or that, quickly or slowly. The enemy is left vulnerable when their rhythm is in disarray. Any individual or group put in an extended state of confusion will ultimately collapse. 
considered at the individual or personal level, you'll notice that much of your procrastination and failure to act stems either from confusion over how to act or a lack of sufficient meaning in acting. Frequently, we allow deadlines to approach or a situation to hit rock bottom before acting in order to maximize the necessity or meaning behind our acting. In psychological terms, we are maximizing the psychological valence before we act. This is obviously illogical. However, for the better part of our lives, we are not logical. We are at once both rational and irrational creatures. Considering confusion at the group level, it's worth asking to what extent Western society as a whole is affected. Many of our previous sources of meaning, such as religion and national identity, have faded due to centuries of reductive analysis, essentially reasoning them out of existence. In their place, we are left grasping for replacements, with religions giving way to political ideologies, national identities to racial and sexual ones, and local communities to online ones. Perhaps even the resurgence of Stoicism and books such as Gurin no Sho are themselves a manifestation of this search for meaning. Either way, judicious use of infectious behaviour can aid in seizing the initiative. In its simplest sense, initiative is about performing actions which necessitate a response from your opponent. In doing so, you become proactive and they become reactive. This is paramount to Masashi's strategy and permeates his work. Taking the initiative is the key to quick victory and is thus the most crucial aspect of combat strategy. For a theoretical understanding, consider the game of chess. White moves first and can be said to start with tempo or the initiative. But assume black moves his queen to threaten white's rook and white responds by retreating out of danger. In this case, black can be said to have seized the initiative as he has forced a reaction out of white and gained a free move on him, which he can now use to continue the chain of threatening pieces whilst developing his own. If instead white blocked the attack with a sacrificial piece like a pawn, and in doing so also threatened black's queen, then he would have maintained the initiative, as black would be the one forced to react. This is initiative in its simplest game-theoretic sense. For a real-world example, study Caesar's Battle of Ilerda. Faced with a superiorly positioned but mostly passive opponent, Caesar manoeuvred his smaller force to a total victory. His enemy surrendered entirely, and very few casualties were suffered on either side. It is amusing, to me at least, that two of Caesar's most famous expressions, seize the day and the die is cast, are essentially verbalizations of his desire to seize the initiative and then watch the results play out. In combat, the simplest way to seize the initiative is to attack first. Masashi even favors this over a strong defensible position. It is essential in war to position your troops in the most favorable site before the battle begins. It is twice as advantageous to take the initiative and attack first, rather than wait for the enemy to do so. This extends to individual combat. Aggression and forward action are always favored, and assuming stances and passive defenses are not, as they actively surrender the initiative to the opponent. To carelessly assume a stance is a declaration of your intention to wait for the opponent to move. I am thus averse to stances if it means relinquishing the initiative. Assuming an unflinching sword stance to parry an attack is effectively the same as constructing a protective fence of pikes and glaives. When you strike the enemy, pull the fence posts out and use them as pikes and glaives. A hunch I have is that most of us view patience and a defensive stance as indicative of restraint and, therefore, wisdom. This bias is likely borne out of watching too many kung fu movies, where the wise master contemptuously awaits his opponent's attacks and then utterly dismantles them. Despite knowing such tropes to be fanciful, we find them appealing and so wants to believe the pattern that those who attack first are the ones who lose. In reality, of course, it's the other way around. In the way of combat, it is perilous to go on the defensive in a bout by allowing yourself to be manipulated. Whatever it takes, you must be the one who dominates. Blocking his attack, deflecting his thrusts, and breaking free of his grip means that you are on the back foot in terms of combat strategy. 
it is also perilous to rely on counterattacking, as this is essentially giving the initiative to the enemy. That said, one does not always have the chance to strike first. In such situations, Masashi mentions that it's still possible to maintain the initiative by influencing when the enemy strikes. Present him with a feigned sign of weakness. Just as he gets in close, move back resolutely, showing that you are about to pounce, and strike him. This is one way of taking the initiative. The vital point here is that while he is striking first, you are influencing when and where he strikes. Although you will not always be the first to attack, seize the initiative to control your opponent's movement. Closely aligned with this is the principle of arresting the shadow. Applying mostly to large-scale combat, this suggests clearly demonstrating your intention to disrupt your enemy's plans. This sows doubt in his mind and can cause him to hesitate, ultimately providing an opportunity to take the initiative. In large-scale strategy, the moment you recognize that the enemy is about to act, you suppress them. If you convincingly demonstrate your intent to completely stifle their assault, the enemy, being constricted, will quickly have a change of heart. You can then alter your approach to seize the initiative and defeat the enemy at will. One step on is stopping the start, where you genuinely shut down your opponent's plans, countering or cutting off every move so as not to allow them to develop. As he attacks, stop him at the A. When he leaps back, stop him at the L. When he cuts, nip it in the bud at the C. It is all done with the same mind. The underlying principles behind each of these are of directing the engagement and avoiding passivity. However, these are still secondary to attacking when given the choice, as ultimately Musashi says, That said, aiming to suppress and thwart your opponent's attempts is akin to losing the initiative. So far, we have discussed things only as they relate to combat, but in day-to-day -day life you've likely also heard the phrase, show some initiative. Such a phrase calls on us to make things happen rather than waiting for them, creating our own luck, so to speak. The irony is if you remain passive and wait for luck to find you, then even if one day it does, you'll likely lack the confidence to capitalise on it. Psychologically speaking, any action or forward progress, regardless of size, triggers positive feelings in our mind, which can themselves lead to further action, resulting in the famed upward spiral. Whereas passivity, even in the lap of luxury, leads to depression. Psychologically then, acting early and not waiting for situations to be optimal is itself optimal. It also follows that seeking passivity as an end goal is a mistake, even in retirement. Rather, you want to go from one completed action to the next to stay motivated. You could think of this as akin to delivering a constant flurry of blows against life, not giving the universe itself a chance to recuperate. No respite should be given so that the enemy has no chance to make a second move. Do bear in mind, though, that the focus of maintaining the initiative is directed at your own life, not those of others. Masashi speaks in terms of combat and life and death situations, as such his opponent is another person. But your opponent in life is the darker side of your own mind, and it's mastery over yourself you're seeking, not over others. As Masashi would say, victory today over the self of yesterday. With all that said, seizing the initiative against an opponent is no easy matter, and each of Masashi's techniques has in it the implicit assumption that you are actually able to discern your enemy's intention. It stands to reason that both you and the enemy are of the same mind, so taking the initiative and leading him will be difficult unless you can read his intentions. This naturally leads to the concept of becoming your enemy. To walk a mile in someone's shoes is a famous aphorism exhorting us to see things from another's perspective. In day-to-day -day life, this helps in understanding people. In combat, it means to foresee actions. Becoming your enemy is to put yourself in his place. But the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side, also reminds us that we tend to overvalue the position of others. 
Mentally placing yourself in their position and seeing things from their perspective lets you more evenly assess their relative strengths. Always ask yourself, if you were in their situation, would you feel confident and what areas would worry you? We are prone to overestimating the enemy's strengths. By putting yourself in his position, however, you realise that he must feel that the whole world is against him. This also naturally encourages you to see flaws in your own plans as seen from their perspective. If you were to attack yourself, so to speak, where would you focus the attack and which defences would worry you? It's easy to brush past such ideas after giving them lip service. But much like the stoic practice of negative visualisation, the act of genuinely contemplating another's perspective takes serious mental effort and is best done through focused thought. A superficial acknowledgement is not enough. On a deeper level, Masashi speaks of even viewing the enemy's troops as under your command. If you can both take the initiative and accurately predict how he will react, you are effectively the one in control of his troops, not him. If you study relentlessly to build strategic wisdom, you will come to think of the enemy's troops as your own and be able to command them to move as you see fit. A light-hearted example of this can be seen in the rivalry between Schwarzenegger and Stallone in the 80s and 90s. At one point, Arnold guided Stallone into taking on a dud movie, Stop or My Mum Will Shoot, by convincing him he planned to take it on himself. Then, in the words of Arnold, Wow, because the movie went major into the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> in effect, when you truly know how an opponent is going to behave in response to your actions, then they cease to be the ones directing their own path. Becoming your enemy is obviously valuable in competitive arenas, but applied retrospectively and in a compassionate spirit, it can also guide us to understand actions we might otherwise see as rude, aggressive or unpleasant. It aligns with Marcus Aurelius's exhortation to be in the mind of the speaker. Habituate yourself not to be inattentive to what another has to say, and, so far as possible, be in the mind of the speaker. This all leads to the ability to recognise when you are of the same mind and highlights the importance of adaptability and starting anew. This is important when a true impasse has been reached. Releasing the forehands is a tactic used when you and your opponent are competing with the same mind and have reached an impasse. If you sense that you are battling with the same mind, discard your current methods and employ alternate ones to seize victory. In such a situation, it is dangerous to employ the same move more than twice. It is perilous to execute the same move repeatedly in a fight. It may be unavoidable to employ a tactic twice, but never do it three times. If an attack is unsuccessful, keep applying pressure and try again. If it still has no effect, quickly adapt and change your approach. Adapting first aligns with seizing the initiative. If you wait for your opponents to be the one to adapt, they will be the one directing the battle, and you will be left reacting. Starting anew is a tactic used when you and your opponent are tangled in a deadlock. In such a case, you must rid yourself of prior feelings and start afresh as if doing everything for the first time. This way, you can employ a new cadence and snatch victory. One method for finding such a cadence is shifting the scale on which you're focusing. When you are fighting with subtleties, suddenly expand your mind and transform into something big. Transitioning between large and small is essential in strategy. If, on the other hand, the enemy is not acting and you cannot ascertain their strategy, feign an all-out assault and they will reveal themselves. Yell A while feigning an attack to lure the opponent into making a move. The principle of being prepared to take bold actions to change the direction of an engagement or lure the opponent into making a move is important for combat. However, it can also be applied to life. As the saying goes, if you're not moving forward, you're falling behind. If no progress is being made for an extended period of time, you are likely regressing. In such cases, it can be advantageous just to start entirely anew. Of course, such situations do beg the question of whether what is required is adaptability or perseverance. 
you need to genuinely ask yourself whether you're adapting or just quitting. Broadly, the focus should be on when a true impasse is encountered. However, accurately assessing such things is what wisdom and training is all about. With this in mind, expect treacherous positions in life. Traversing problematic positions is also necessary at many junctures during a man's life. You should consider problems and treacherous positions as to be expected. Know that you may need to change direction when they occur, and that this change may take you off course. This is part of life, and why adapting is so important. Without an accompanying vessel, you must be aware of your position and ride the crosswinds or catch the tailwind. Be prepared for wind changes and to row two or three leagues to port if required. This is how one traverses perilous passages at sea. This mindset relates to overcoming problematic points in life and should be applied with due concern to the demands of the situation. This ability to accept abandoning positions and plans demands that we learn detachment from all things. In addition to detachment from material possessions, Masashi makes a point of emphasizing detachment from plans, intentions, and locations as well, because without this, you cannot truly be adaptable. For both generals and rank and file, it is harmful to entertain a strong preference for certain things. Having alternate plans is critical. Masashi lived much of his life as a ronin, a wandering masterless samurai. Such a life demanded a certain dispassion towards loss and a supreme ability to adapt and accept constant movement. This mindset is eminently visible in multiple lines from his dokodo. Never let yourself be saddened by a separation. In all things, have no preferences. Be indifferent to where you live. Do not hold on to possessions you no longer need. I would suggest tempering this for modern life. A stoic perspective is that you should enjoy material possessions and the company of those close to you, but also be prepared for their loss. You should appreciate them, but not need them. To this end, negative visualization, or considering what life may be like without them, can make you both prepared for their loss and more appreciative of their presence when you do have them. Naturally, Masashi's detachment extends to life itself, and he promotes a resolute acceptance of death. This mentality is enshrined in Bushido, and not unique to Masashi. In fact, he even mentions it is by no means limited to the domain of the samurai, noting many across society would prefer death over dishonor. The same message can be heard in philosophies from around the world. However, it's usually stated with an eye to removing fear of the future or to inspire one into action in the present, given the shortness of life. Masashi implies a further point, which is that it also allows for clarity in calculated risks that others won't take. In exercising my ideas of strategy, I have put my life on the line many times in combat. I have learned the way of the sword by risking everything in the divide between life and death. It must be reinforced this does not mean being careless with your life, but rather not allowing the fear of death to dissuade you from courageous action. It is less relevant to modern civilian life, where mortal dangers are rarely encountered, but you could perhaps adapt it to the notion of not allowing the risk of loss to dissuade you from courageous action. Think to yourself, who else but I can access the direct path? And I will accomplish this in time. Then throw yourself wholeheartedly into training in the ways of my school from morning to night. You will find liberation once you have mastered the skills and will naturally gain a sublime ability pertinent to all things. This is the necessary disposition of a warrior in the art of combat. Another positive reframe is that if you're suffering now and feel you have very little to be happy for, then you also have very little to lose in taking bold actions to improve things. Nothing lasts forever, and everything is in the process of becoming something else. Take consolation that this applies to you too. Masashi's treatise closes with the Book of the Void, which discusses emptying your mind and lifting the clouds of confusion. Having comprehended the truth of the way, 
you can then let it go. You will find liberation in the way of combat strategy, and naturally attain a marvellous capacity to know the most rational rhythm for every moment. Your strike will manifest on its own, and hit the target on its own. All this represents the way of the ether. He makes a point of saying ether is not ignorance or lack of knowledge, and neither is it that which cannot be distinguished. People tend to mistake this notion of ether as something that cannot be distinguished, but this is not the true ether. So too in the way of combat strategy. Ignorance of the laws of the samurai by those who practice the way of the warrior is not represented as emptiness. Rather, it is the point after much study where confusion lifts and everything becomes clear. True ether is where all the clouds of confusion have completely lifted, leaving not a hint of haziness. This is quite an ethereal concept, and it may be that a proper understanding of it can only be attained from a lifetime of practice. It's also worth noting that Masashi possibly didn't get to expand on the chapter as much as he would have liked, as the book is signed just seven days before his death. He provides a warning that in following your own path you can believe you are acting rightly, but when compared with truth, the scale and reason for your departure becomes obvious. When you are impervious to the true way, faithfully following your own instead, thinking all is well, you will stray further from the truth. When the spirit is uncurled and compared with overarching universal principles, it becomes evident that a prejudiced mind and a distorted view of things have led to a departure from the proper path. The scroll ends with an exhortation to stick assiduously to the true way and observe what opens before you. Know this mind and use what is straight as your foundation. Make the sincere heart your way as you practice strategy in its broadest sense, correctly and lucidly. Ponder the ether as you study the way. As you practice the way, the ether will open before you. There is good, not evil, in the ether. There is wisdom. There is reason. There is the way. The mind empty. Twelfth day of the fifth month, 1645. Shinmen Musashi Genshin. Ends Notes to perish with a weapon uselessly sheathed at one side is shameful. A notable point left from the body of this summary is that Masashi favoured dual-wielding the katana and wakizashi short sword, at the same time. First, we learn to simultaneously wield both swords in Nito and become accustomed to handling the longsword freely with one hand. Some have suggested, though, that when facing a single competent opponent, he would only use the katana. I have left a complex discussion of this out, because, while interesting, it is mostly about sword technique rather than deeper principles. If a core principle is to be gleaned from it, it's to do what works and not artificially restrict yourself, accepting that everything starts out difficult. In my school, victory must be attainable equally with both long and short weapons. That is why I have established no length for the swords we use. The way of my school is to win no matter what. In the beginning, it is challenging for everyone to brandish a heavy long sword with one hand. Everything is difficult at first. Other work. In addition to Gorin no Sho, Musashi wrote several other books. Heidol Kyo, or Mirror on the Way of Combat, in 1604, aged 20. Musashi created his Enmei Ryu school after defeating a celebrated Yoshioka swordsman in a series of duels, and wrote this treatise the following year. If you're interested in precise sword fighting techniques, then this goes into much more detail regarding stance, strikes, and distances. Gurin no Sho, by comparison, is geared more towards mentality, strategy, and pursuit of the way. Heihou Kakitsuke, or Notes on Combat Strategy, in 1638, aged 54. This was written as a technical guide and transmission license for his students. Heiho Sanju Go Kajo, or Combat Strategy in 35 Articles, in 1641, aged 57. This was written for Hosokawa Tadatoshi, Lord of the Hosokawa Domain in Kumamoto, 
As such, the tone of the text is honorific. It was also used as a transmission scroll and added to by Terao Maganojo in 1666. Goho no Tachimichi, or Five Direction Sword Pathways, around 1643 as the original introduction to Godin no Shō. This was written entirely in Kanbun, or Chinese script, and paid homage to Buddha, as was the convention at the time. However, Masashi removed it from the final version, as he reportedly felt it too ostentatious. It's possible he didn't want anything superfluous in the work, as in the final introduction he mentions, As I write this dissertation, I do not appropriate terms from Buddhist law or Confucius teachings, nor do I quote old customs from ancient war chronicles and military texts. Finally, the Dokodo, or Path Walked Alone, in 1645, one week before his passing at 61. He is said to have written it the day he handed Godin no Shō to Terao Maganojo. It lists his 21 concise principles for life. Some translations give them as instructions, others as self-reflective statements. Here they are as instructions. 1. Accept everything just the way it is. 2. Do not seek pleasure for its own sake. 3. Do not, under any circumstances, depend on a biased feeling. 4. Think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. 5. Be detached from desire your whole life long. 6. Do not regret what you have done. 7. Never be jealous. 8. Never let yourself be saddened by a separation. 9. Resentment and complaint are appropriate neither for oneself nor others. 10. Do not let yourself be guided by the feeling of lust or love. 11. In all things have no preferences. 12. Be indifferent to where you live. 13. Do not pursue the taste of good food. 14. Do not hold on to possessions you no longer need. 15. Do not act following customary beliefs. 16. Do not collect weapons or practice with weapons beyond what is useful. 17. Do not fear death. 18. Do not seek to possess either goods or fiefs for your old age. 19. Respect Buddha and the gods without counting on their help. 20. You may abandon your own body, but you must preserve your honour. 21. Never stray from the way. The Masashi Legend As Einstein, Shakespeare and Masashi have all noted, the internet attributes quotations to you that you never said. One such example following Masashi around is the line, There is nothing outside of yourself that can ever enable you to get better, stronger, richer, quicker or smarter. Everything is within. Everything exists. Seek nothing outside of yourself. The Internet, circa 2020. While inspiring in its own way, this is not from Masashi. It appears only in the Steve Kaufman translation and is likely his own interpretation of Masashi's message rather than a translation of his writing. The concept the quote expresses is that success comes from your actions and your decision to follow the way and dedicate yourself to training, rather than from external techniques. This is indeed consistent with Masashi's message, but presenting it as a quote or translation is clearly misleading. To further temper the legend, it's also worth noting that not all Masashi's jewels were to the death. It's unknown precisely how many were, as there aren't reliable accounts of them all, but 17th century Japan was still a civil society, and people generally disfavoured being killed, so some jewels were done with wooden swords. Here are a few passages detailing some of the non-fatal ones, so you can be sure they existed. They are taken from the book The Complete Masashi, which is an excellent resource for further reading. When Masashi realised that Gunbei's purpose was to challenge him in a bout, he nonchalantly agreed and asked his would-be opponent to choose between live blades or wooden swords. Gunbei chose the safer option, wooden swords, but received a very bloody mouth for his troubles. 
from Kaijo Monogatari, 1666, paraphrased. Masashi smacked the staff-wielding Gonmusuki in the head with a half-finished bow he was making. Conceding defeat, the ever-optimistic Gonmusuki went on to create Shinto Musoryu school of staff fighting, which is still an influential tradition in stick martial arts today. From Bukoden, paraphrased. Masashi fought Yashiro in three bouts. Yashiro's skills were completely ineffectual, and he was unable to break Masashi's defence. Masashi, on the other hand, contented himself by effortlessly deflecting all that Yashiro threw at him. Tadatoshi was so impressed, he also asked Masashi for a match. Equally flummoxed by Masashi's style, Tadatoshi then became his student. In addition to this, practically everything you've heard about Masashi's duel with Sasaki Kojiro on Ganryu Jima is likely false, extending even to the surname Sasaki, which was adopted from a depiction of Kojiro's character in a kabuki play made years later. As great as the story is, there's nothing to suggest Masashi arrived hours late to rile up his opponent, or that he fashioned a wooden sword out of an oar. But then again, this is likely how legends form. Someone great exists, and over time, further deeds, acts and sayings are attributed to them, until they become an archetype for us to aspire to. A symbol of what, if you truly put your mind to it, you can achieve. From a purely practical standpoint, it could even be that such legends are more important than truth. There are in our world many value systems, each not necessarily consistent with the next, and if what one is after is mastery and fulfilment, then dedicating your life to one of these and trying to live up to it is far more effective than perpetual reductive analysis. We are, after all, creatures driven by meaning. In the words of Masashi, If you purge yourself of mistaken ideas and methods in pursuit of the way, progress in a correct manner, train day in and day out endeavouring to become an expert, a mystical power will aid you in mastery. It seems unlikely this mystical power can be accessed without complete belief in the path you're on. With that said, the only thing left to argue over is how many Western longswords a katana could beat in battle. The comment section is open for business. If you enjoyed this summary, then I suggest clicking here to see my summary of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. If you'd like to support me in future work, send a donation through the link in the description. There's also a free PDF version of this summary in there as well. If you want a hard copy of Gurin no Sho, I strongly recommend the complete Masashi over all other versions. Again, link in the description.